Okay, as promised, here is the answer key to the review for the final exam. Number one, a beaker breaks during a lab and shatters on the ground. The shattering of the glass, that is a physical change. What is the formula for 10,4 chlorate? So you follow the same rules you normally would. You write the symbol for 10, SN. The 4 indicates that it has a plus 4 charge. Chlorate, it ends in ATE. So this is not chlorine, it's not chloride. You look on the back of your periodic table and you'll find that chlorate is ClO3 and it has a minus 1 charge. Then you do your crisscross and you take your 4 and you bring it down here and your 1 would go down here. Now the problem is you can't have that 3 and 4 next to each other so the chlorate needs to be in parentheses. So your final answer is SN parentheses ClO3 with a 4 at the end of it. An ionic bond results from the electrical attra attraction between a metal and a non-metal. You could also say this is a cation, which is positive, and an anion, which is negative. State whether each of the following is a physical or a chemical change. Gasoline burning, that's clearly chemical because a new substance is being made. Copper being stretched, nothing new is made, so that's physical. Water being boiled, well, ice, water, steam, they're all the same thing, so that's also physical. And dissolving, this is also a physical change. We still have salt and we still have water. Name the compound Ni2O3. So we follow the same rules that we've learned before. The first one is name the metal. So the first me the metal is nickel, N-I-C-K-E-L. Now the thing is, nickel is not in the first two groups or a special. So it has a charge we're going to have to include in its name. So I wrote some parentheses here to leave room for that charge. Then we name the nonmetal and change the ending to IDE. That's oxygen, so I'm going to change it to oxide. We need to know what goes in here. The way we do that is we look at the nonmetal. The nonmetal oxygen, oxygen has a negative 2 charge, and there are three of them. So that equals negative 6. So the charge on the negative part of this is negative 6. That means the nickel part has to be positive 6. Since there are two of them, each one of them is going to be 3. So this is nickel 3 oxide. Number 6. State whether each of the following is a chemical property or a physical property. So a chemical property is something that in order to observe we've got to have some new substance created. Physical properties, we don't need a new substance. So a blue-gray color, that's clearly a physical property. A brittle solid at 20 degrees, nothing new is made, that's a physical property. Silicon reacts with fluorine, that's a key word right there, it reacts. In order to react, something new is made. So that's a chemical property. Silicon has a melting point of 1,414 degrees Celsius. Uh, we don't need to uh, make anything new, so that's just a physical property. All right, let's take a look at number seven. Based on the electromagnetic spectrum, what is the relationship between wavelength and frequency. So what you're going to see is probably something like a, uh, a, a curve that looks like this and then it gets 
uh, more wiggly and what you'll see is this is increasing frequency and uh, this is increasing wavelength lambda and what that means is when we have a large wavelength we have a low frequency and when we have a short wavelength we have a high frequency so that means that as one goes up the other goes down and that means this is an inverse relationship as one goes up the other goes down number eight what element is represented by the orbital filling diagram shown below so the first thing we can do is we can look at this and we can see 3p has three things in it and if we look at our periodic table we'll see that something with three things in it uh, in 3p is phosphorus but an easier way to do that is count the electrons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. There are 15 electrons here. 15 electrons is phosphorus. What is the electron configuration for manganese, atomic number 25? So an electron configuration is something that we have to go on and write out. Um, so we start off with 1s2 uh, and that would be hydrogen and helium then we have 2s2 then we have 2p6 then we have 3s2 then we have 3p6 and if we actually add up our electrons right now we have 2, 4 then another 6 that's 10 then another 2 and another 6 that's 8 so we're up to 18 uh, we come to 4s2 that's 20 so we need five more electrons and remember that after 4s2 we drop back down to 3 so we have 3d and if we count over to manganese we'll see 3d5 uh, and you can actually look at your periodic table and you'll see 3d5 is where it's going to end so find an answer that ends in 3d5 where should all lab waste be disposed of well not the trash can not the sink that's wherever your teacher says where your your teacher says what is the formula for lithium sulfide? So, lithium is a metal. Sulfide, IDE, indicates this is a binary compound. Remember, endings are important, IDE. So this is two elements, lithium and sulfur. So let's start with Li and S. The next thing we'll do is we'll take a look at their charges. Lithium is a plus one sulfur is a minus two so we crisscross the two will go down there the one will go down there we don't write ones in chemistry so Li2S the next one number 12 which element is represented by the orbital diagram shown below again we can just count the electrons if we really want to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So this is element number 13, and that's aluminum. The other thing we can do is we can look at 3P1. That's where it ends. So if we look in the 3P group and look at the first one there, we'll see that's also aluminum. The next question, what is the equipment to the right? I hope everybody recognizes that. It is a graduated cylinder. It is the best thing in chemistry for measuring. Okay, let's look at number 14. 
what is the group, period, and block of an atom with the electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, etc., all the way to 4p4. That's the only thing that really matters to us. Take a look at the periodic table. 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is the fourth row. Let's go over to 4p. This is the p block right here, right? Everything in here is the p block. So 4p, 1, 2, 3, 4. Looks like selenium to me. So, um, if we want to count electrons, we can do that. 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 6 is 10, 11, 12, 18, 20, uh, 30, 34. And if we look over here, it's 34. So, what is the group, period, etc.? Well, the period is 4. If I can get that back in on the screen. The period is 4. Go across. And the group down here is 16. And this entire section right here is the non-metals. So what we're looking at is period is equal to 4. The group is equal to 16. And it's a non-metal. What group and family does the element with the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, etc., etc., belong to? The key thing, 3d5. So, again, pull out the periodic table. Remember that the d block and the d block, that's all of these guys right here, they're one behind. Uh, so, these, this is 3d, that's where that starts. So 3D5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's manganese. So uh, what does this belong to? Uh, it belongs to uh, the transition metals. And if we're really a little more interested, we can say uh, that's in period 4, and it's in... Uh, it's in uh, group uh, group seven because well that's manganese four and seven but this entire section is the transition metals hazard symbol flammable if it had a little O under it that would be oxidizer but no O that's flammable Next, what is the molecular geometry of PCL3? And it says do your own S equals N minus A work and draw the structure first. So you've got a block on your test where you can do that. Um, what you need to do is add up all of the electrons. So P, phosphorus, uh, on your periodic table, phosphorus is right here, and it has five valence electrons and Cl over here, it has seven valence electrons, and there are three of them. So phosphorus equals five, and then we have Cl, uh, that equals seven times three, so that's 21. If we add that up together, we get 26 electrons. Um, divide by two, and we have 13 pairs. So 13 pairs to work with. Um, and we're looking for the molecular geometry. So the first thing we have to do is do our dot diagram. So we'll start with uh, putting our P in the middle and our chlorines around the side, CL, CL, CL. doesn't really matter where you put them. And I need to use up 13 pairs somehow. So I'll start by putting a pair there, a pair there, and a pair there. So that takes away three of my pairs and leaves me with ten left. Next, I'm going to put three around each of the outer atoms, which I can do unless they're hydrogen. Hydrogen I can't put any at, uh, electrons on. So one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. So that's nine. So minus n ten minus nine, that equals one. So I've got one pair left that I have to do something with. Well, that right there is going to go on the central atom, phosphorus. The next thing I need to do is look at and see what the geometry is. So I need to know the electron domains 
or the uh, domains that we've got from the central atom. I've got one coming out this way, one that way, one that way, and one this way because the pair counts. So I have four domains. And of the domains, how many of those domains are lone pairs? Well, just that one right there. So one lone pair. Um, so since it asks for molecular geometry, we can look that up on our chart and we'll find out that this is trigonal pyramidal. So what that means is we've got a CL, we've got a CL, and it comes up to a P, down to a P, and then sticking out somewhere, we've got uh, some electrons, and then some other direction here, we've got another CL. So this is basically a tiny little pyramid with CL, 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 a phosphorus in the middle, and some electrons sticking out the top. Uh, remember to use your yellow sheet uh, and look these up, domains and lone pairs. And that's how you solve that problem. Um, next, based on the electromagnetic spectrum, which color of visible light has the shortest wavelength? You'll probably be given a picture. Uh, the picture that you'll be given will be one of those little squiggly line pictures. It'll start off like real broad on one side and then narrow to the other side. Remember it says shortest wavelength. So wavelength is the distance between uh, the waves. So wherever they're close together, that's what you want. Uh, for visible light, the shortest wavelength is ultraviolet, or pardon me, is violet. Uh, violet, not ultraviolet, violet. But if you're given a choice and violet isn't one of them, pick one that's close to violet. So uh, you know that uh, old expression, Roy G. Biv, uh, R-O-Y-G-B-V. Uh, violet is the shortest. Blue would be next, and then green, and then yellow, and then orange, and then red. So uh, the one that's furthest uh, to the right on this list uh, would be the correct answer. Uh, and that would be, in my case, violet. Now, your picture may be backwards on your test. I don't know which direction it's going to look. Um, so uh, just take a look at your picture and find the one where the waves are closest together, all right, not far apart, but closest together, and that will give you the uh, shortest wavelength, and look at what color is closest. All right, the next question is kind of confusing. It says, draw a Bohr model of the atom, and it doesn't tell you what kind of atom they're talking about. So, and then it says label the electrons, protons, and neutrons. And here they've given you a little box. I'm not going to draw in this box. I'm going to draw outside of the box. Um, but uh, let's suppose that a dark circle is a proton. And I'm going to pick something like lithium. Uh, lithium has three protons. So I'll draw three protons here. One, two, three. And then I'll pick a different color to draw my neutrons. And lithium has two isotopes. Lithium can have three neutrons, or it can have four neutrons. It doesn't really matter. Maybe I'll draw a fourth one in there anyway, because that's the most common. So now we've got our three protons and three or four neutrons. So this is the nucleus of the atom. But here's the key word. Bohr model. So when they talk about a Bohr model, they're not really talking about this nucleus where the protons and neutrons live. What they're talking about is where do the electrons live. And the electrons live in energy levels that are on the outside of the atom. Okay, And there are many, many energy levels. We learned a whole bunch about energy levels. But what's the most important about energy levels is that energy levels fill from the bottom up and only a certain number can fit in each energy level. So for my lithium, I had three 
um, I had three protons, uh, so that means I'll have three electrons. I can fit two of them, if I can find a pen that works, I can fit two of them in the first energy level, and then it's full. So the third one has to go in the next highest energy level. So we fill from the bottom up. When we're looking at, um, at a Bohr model, it's important that you understand that, that uh, electrons uh, occupy energy levels. Okay, So electrons um, are in levels. The levels fill from the bottom up. Uh, so they fill bottom up and only so many can fit in each level. Only some in each level. Some of the things that do not apply to Bohr models would be uh, that they they orbit around like those pictures you see in the movies uh, where they are spinning around in those fancy little levels. Um, they don't uh, live in the nucleus, uh, those kind of things. Uh, it's important that you understand these concepts. They, uh, they fill from the bottom up and only certain energy levels are allowed. We can't have electrons in between energy levels. Alright, number 20. List four things that you should always do when you're finished with a laboratory investigation. List four things you should always do when finished with a laboratory investigation involving chemicals. Well, there's a lot of things that you should do. Um, you want to clean up the area, uh, so uh, clean, uh, clean your area. Um, you want to clean around, around your area. You want to put away um, all of your equipment, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, you want to wash everything. So basically everything. All right. uh, number 21. Elements with the same reactivity will have the same number of valence electrons, protons, neutrons, electrons, and will be in the same group period on the periodic table. Okay, so here what they're doing is they're saying, do you know what these things mean? the same number of valence electrons, they're talking about the valence electrons, not the same number of electrons, but the same number of valence electrons. And what that means is they're going to be in the same group. So let's go back to the periodic table. Take a look at this. Um, potassium, calcium, scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, these are all in the same period, but they don't have the same number of valence electrons. These guys right here all do. These all have one valence electron, and these right here all have two valence electrons. If we skip over to the other reactive end of the periodic table and look at fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they all have seven and oxygen and sulfur and selenium, they all have six. These are all in the same group and they all have the same number of valence electrons. So don't worry about periods going across. Periods going across have nothing to do with the reactivity uh, the way we've learned it. The most important thing are the groups going up and down. Up and down is very important when we're talking about how a chemical behaves and how it behaves like its neighbors. Uh, number 22, uh, it says draw some models, because I can 
can get this back into the screen here, uh, to show um, elements, compounds, and mixtures. I, I'm not really a great artist, but, you know, elements uh, could just be little things like that. Compounds, uh, we might could have some water molecules uh, like that. But notice that they're exactly the same. These are elements, these are compounds. Now I can also have elements that were diatomic elements like nitrogen, uh, like those. Uh, those could be elements too, but I doubt you'll see those. So these are elements and these are compounds. Now the fact that they're compounds can be recognized by the fact that they all have the exact same ratio of, of uh, circles. So if I were to color these, I could say I, they all have one red circle and two brown circles. And that would make those compounds. Um, if there were any that had a different number of, of uh, red and brown circles, they would not be compounds. And then a mixture of elements, um, well, I could have uh, some single elements over here, maybe some diatomic elements uh, like this. Um, if I wanted to make it a true mixture, maybe I could even make it a mixture with some compounds in here, like my little Mickey Mouse here at water. Uh, but this would be a mixture. Okay, so mixtures are not pure comp uh, are not pure substances. Compounds are pure substances because they are all exactly alike. And elements are all pure substances because they are all exactly alike. The next question, um, what particle is needed to complete this nuclear reaction? So this is a pretty simple math problem right here. Remember that we treat the, equal, or the arrow like an equal sign. So if we treat the arrow like an equal sign, all we've got to do is check the numbers on the top and bottom. 222 is equal to 218 plus something. What's the something? Well, it's got to be 4. On the bottom, 86 is equal to 84 plus something. Well, that's got to be 2. 4 over 2, well, that right there is a helium nucleus. Okay, so that's the missing particle. You may also remember that a helium nucleus is an alpha particle. That's A-L-P-H-A. And that's on the back of your periodic table in case you didn't recall. Okay, so alpha particle is on the back of your periodic table. All right. Um, 24. John Dalton previously thought that atoms were uh, solid balls. Okay. Uh, he thought that they were indivisible. He thought that they were identical for the same element. So, there were lots of things. Uh, but the most important thing about this is that he thought they were indivisible. That means they can't be broken down. And then it says, until Thompson discovered what? And J.J. Thompson, with his cathode ray tube, the great fashion of the day, he discovered electrons. Okay? With called them cathode rays. Alright. So when he discovered electrons, then that defeated John Dalton's idea about atoms being indivisible because clearly there was something that was smaller than an atom, and that was the electron. Um, 25. List every part of the atom, protons, neutrons, and electrons, that is the same in an isotope of an element. So, 
the only answer to that is protons. You could also say electrons if you wanted to, um, because electrons and protons tend to go together in a neutral atom. But the big thing that's not the same is neutrons. We can go back to our lithium atom. Remember our lithium atom, we had three protons for our lithium atom, and around the outside of our lithium atom, we also had three electrons, one, two, and then a third one in another energy level. But what about those neutrons? Well, some lithium atoms have three neutrons, and some of them have four. So the neutrons can be different in an isotope. And the neutrons, they don't affect how it behaves chemically, but they have a big effect on the mass. Because neutrons weigh as much as a proton, so they have an effect on mass. Let's take a look at the next one. Uh, not quite sure what the question says. How would this be seen in nuclear symbol notation for isotopes of the element neon? Well, neon, N-E, uh, we know that neon has an atomic number of 10. Um, and it has a mass of, could be 20, um, uh, could be 21, because some neon has 21, uh, or has 11 neutrons. Uh, so these would both be isotopes of neon. Uh, but uh, how they're going to ask you this on the test, I'm not sure. My guess will be that they might switch those numbers around. What if they put the 10 on top and the 21 on the bottom? Is this an isotope of neon? No, this right here doesn't even exist. So if you're looking for isotopes, isotopes, what you need to do is you need to find something that has the same atomic number and the same symbol but it has a different mass. And that just means it has a different number of neutrons. All right, 26. Element X has two known naturally occurring isotopes. The mass and relative abundance of each are shown. What is the average atomic mass to the nearest hundredth of an atomic mass unit? So the way we do this, is we just take our percentage and multiply by our mass. So we'll do this times this, and we'll do this times this. And for this, I'm going to need to have a calculator in front of me. So let me open one of those up on my computer here real quick. Um, so I see 60.57 times 74.92 and I get this big whopping number which is 4,537.9 now I'll do it to this 39.43 times 80.92 and I get this other big number which is 3,190.7. And if I add those two numbers together, let's see, 45, 37, point 9, I get, once I've added these together, I get 7728.about6. Uh, now, since percentages are parts of a hundred, I could have moved my decimal point over by two, or this one over by two, 
but I figured why bother I'll do it at the end so let me move this over by two now and uh, what do I end up with 77.286 so 77.28 or 77.29 is going to be the average and on a multiple choice test which I think you're getting um, those numbers are going to be uh, pretty close uh, you're not going to have to worry about 2.8 or 2.9 uh, and if they are that close then go back and do your math and keep some more significant figures. Uh, number 27, a covalent bond is formed when two atoms blank electrons. So covalent bonds we share. Remember ionic transfer. Ionic transfer one steals and one uh, one loses and one gains, but uh, uh, covalent bonds share. What is the molecular geometry of H2O? So it says do the uh, S equals N minus A in the space below, so let's do that. So we have H, um, which has one electron, we have uh, another H which has one electron and we have O which has six so if we add all those up we get eight that's four pair so we have four pair of electrons to work with we'll put the O in the middle we'll put the H is on either side so our two bonds that takes up two of our pairs so minus two what are we going to do with the other two pair well, we can't put them around the outside atoms because H doesn't allow it, so we'll just put them right there. And now we have to look at the um, number of domains. So how many directions do things point out? Well, one points out that way, one that way, one that way, and one that way. So we have four domains. How many of those domains are lone pairs? Well, there's one and there's another. So we have two lone pairs. And if we look that up on our, uh, on our table, we'll see that that's called angular, uh, angular or bent. And that's exactly what it is. Uh, we have oxygen. We have hydrogen sticks out here. We have another hydrogen sticks out here. We have some electrons that poke out towards us. And then we also have some electrons uh, going back into the page, back behind what we can see. Uh, next, number 29. Describe the characteristics of the valence electrons in a metallic bond. So in a metallic bond, what we've got are a whole bunch of metal atoms. And the metal atoms have all of these valence electrons that uh, are free to move around uh, from metal to metal and uh, bounce around. They can leave, they can come back, and we call this the C of mobile valence electrons. And that those things are responsible for almost all the properties of metals. It allows us to dent a metal. It allows a metal to have uh, uh, electricity flow through it and heat flow through it. Uh, and uh, it's why they're ductile. Um, but a, the C of valence electrons, uh, the, the, uh, the electrons move all over the place in a metallic bond. They're not stuck like they are in a covalent bond. In a covalent bond they're shared which means neither atom wants to let go. And in an ionic bond one of them has stolen it from another. So one's missing an electron and the other has it and won't let go of it. But in a metallic bond the electrons are all shared. They wander around from place to place and that allows metals to conduct electricity and conduct heat and get bent all out of shape without it bothering them any. Uh, it's a great deal for metals. Alright, draw the correct Lewis structure 
and then it says Vesper here for ASH3 and it, then it says do all the math and everything like that. So the first thing we need to do is say what the heck is AS? AS is arsenic. So it's right here on the periodic table. Arsenic, if we go up nitrogen, we can see that it has five valence electrons. So we'll start with uh, uh, AS uh, has five and then we have uh, H3 so uh, each of those has one so we'll add three to that so we end up with five plus three that's eight which means we have four pair so we can do our AS and then we'll do our H and our H and our H around that the next thing we'll do is we'll throw in our bonds one two three well if I can draw them there we go one two three so take away three pair and that leaves us with one pair left over what do we do with those well leftover pairs go on the central atom they would normally go if we had chlorines or fluorines or something they'd go on the outside atoms but remember hydrogen can't take any so we end up with that and it doesn't really matter if you draw this right side up or upside down you could have drawn this AS with the H's here and here and our little double dots on the bottom it would have made one bit of difference when you're looking at the shape of this this is another one of those trigonal pyramidal things where we have the AS and we have an H coming off here another H coming off here we've got uh, an H maybe over there and then we have uh, some electrons poking out there like that um, it depends on your yellow sheet and how you rotate this around um, but uh, basically it's a little it's a little three-sided pyramid with some electrons poking out the top uh, the next question it looks like uh, we've got things covered up where we can't see it in this picture anyway but it says ionization increases blank direction so what happens to ionization energy ionization energy is how hard it is to take an, an electron away from an atom and that guy right there has the highest ionization energy helium H E so it increases as we go up and to the right remember big fat Freddy down here um, it's easy to take electrons from him because his electrons are so far away remember big fat Freddy has got a whole bunch of electron energy levels he's got like seven energy levels and his last electron is way way far away so taking it away hardly even lets him notice but helium helium only has one energy level and her two electrons are being held real close and uh, she's not letting go so ionization energy uh, increases as we go up and to the right towards helium um, also uh, in this same direction we also have uh, not just ionization energy uh, but we have electronegativity um, and electronegativity follows the same pattern except that it stops with uh, floozy fluorine because remember that the uh, noble gases they don't have any electronegativity because electronegativity is how strong do they want to take an electron away from another atom uh, in, a, in a bond and, uh, and those noble gases don't want to take any electrons they've got enough okay but the trend goes in the exact same direction all right 32 Mendeleev was able to predict missing elements and fill in the gaps by organizing them according to similar properties okay 
He started off by organizing them by mass, but once he had them in a line by mass, he started lining them up by their properties. Uh, number 33, draw a dot diagram that shows the interaction between Mg and Cl, and what kind of bond is this, ionic or covalent? So the first thing we'll do is let's draw Mg. So here's Mg. And if we look on our periodic table, here's Mg, and we can see that it has two valence electrons up there. So let me go on and draw those two valence electrons. Doesn't matter where I put them as long as I spread them out. There we go. And then let's also draw chlorine. So here's chlorine, and chlorine has seven valence electrons. So I'm going to draw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So chlorine has three pairs of electrons um, and one single. So magnesium is a metal and it wants to get rid of its electrons. Chlorine is a non-metal and she wants to take electrons if she can. Well, one of these from magnesium can go right over there to the chlorine and fill in that empty gap. But what's this other one going to do? Well, it's going to have to go, guess what, to another chlorine. So I'm going to go on and draw another one. I'm going to do a shortcut here and just draw the dots not in order but we can see that these go over there like that. What this results in, finally, is that we have magnesium with a plus two charge. And you may say, magnesium lost two. Why does it have a plus two charge? Remember that electrons are negative. So if we lose two negatives, that's a positive. And what about the chlorine? Well, the chlorines, each of them now have eight electrons. And this chlorine right here, it gained one electron, so it has a negative one charge. And then we also have another chlorine. And we often draw these on opposite sides. It has a negative one to show that these two are attracted to the magnesium in the middle. So we have negative, negative, and a plus two in the middle. This is an ionic bond because we gained and lost electrons. Remember, covalent bonds share. Ionic bonds gain and lose. Magnesium lost an electron to each of these two chlorines. A scientist discovers 34.54 grams of sugar, oh, dissolves, sorry, into 105 grams of water. The formation of the solution is an example of what kind of change. Well, remember, dissolving is always a physical change. Draw the structure for CH2O. So we're going to do the same thing we've done before. So we've got C, it has four. Uh, we've got two H's, each of them have one, so that's another two, and O has six, so if we add up all of those electrons, we end up with 12 electrons. So we'll start with the carbon in the middle, we'll put the hydrogens on each side and an oxygen up there, doesn't really matter where we put them. Uh, but we've got 12 electrons, we divide that by two, and that gives us six pair to work with. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw a line between each. One, two, three. So take away three pair and that leaves us with three left. So what are we going to do with these guys? Well, they go around the outside atoms. One, two, three around oxygen. That looks like we're done, but there's a problem. Remember Synops, uh, C-N-O-P-S. I always want to put a Y in there like Cyclops, but C-N-O-P-S.
Herman must have four uh, pairs of electrons, and it doesn't. So what that means is I'm going to have to steal two electrons from oxygen and turn this into a double bond. So my final product is going to be carbon with a hydrogen over here, a hydrogen over here, and a double bond to an oxygen, which is going to have two lone pairs. And if we look this up on our chart, we'll see the directions. There's one, two, three directions and no lone pairs. So three, zero on our chart means that this is going to be trigonal planar. Number 36, for the three types of radioactive decay, what is the correct order of most penetrating to human tissue to least penetrating? Well, the worst stuff is the stuff that makes the incredible hulk. That's gamma rays. Gamma rays, okay? So think hulk. That's the worst. Uh, after that, we have beta rays. Beta rays are like electrons. Um, and electricity, it can shock us, right? Um, so uh, a beta rays can actually get through your skin a little bit. They can cause a, a heck of a burn. Um, but uh, generally, a piece of aluminum foil is good enough to stop them the way aluminum would stop electricity. And then the least penetrating are alpha particles. Because remember, alpha particles, once they pick an electron up, uh, or two uh, from the atmosphere, they're just helium atoms, and helium really doesn't do as much harm. So alpha rays are actually the safest. So gamma, beta, alpha, from worst to least. Gamma rays, think Hulk, right? The Hulk, right? Put the following uh, in number order by discovery. So, electrons discovered, energy levels are found to exist, atoms are discovered to be the smallest particle, and the positive dense center is discovered. So, the first thing is going to be the fact that we discovered atoms. So, uh, number three, that's going to be the first thing, discovered some atoms. Uh, the next thing is we discovered that atoms weren't really the smallest thing, Electrons were the smallest thing. So... I'm having trouble connecting to the internet. Take a look at the help section in your Alexa app. Well, that was interesting. So we discovered electrons next. Uh, the next thing uh, that we discovered, and that was Rutherford with his gold foil experiment, he discovered that there was a positive dense center in his uh, in the atoms. Uh, so uh, that was the nucleus. So that was number four. And finally we had Niels Bohr uh, and he's listed here as number two. Niels Bohr discovered that uh, the uh, electrons must exist within certain energy levels and that those levels um, exist in all atoms um, and uh, that they uh, uh, can't be anywhere in between. All right, 38. Based on the electromagnetic spectrum, yellow light compared to blue light has lower or higher frequency. Okay, now remember, what we're going to see is you're going to see a picture that looks something like this, and it's going to get zigzaggier and closer together and stuff. And all of the answers are going to be on this picture. So it's going to have something like blue over here and red over here. Um, so uh, when it talks about this, um, yellow compared to blue has lower or higher frequency. So yellow, of course, is going to be somewhere in here. And we're going to see that it has a lower frequency because these are high frequency over here all right so this is the high frequency and the red and yellow are low so it's going to have 
the yellow is going to have a lower frequency. Ah, but what about energy? Remember the wave thing that we did with the spring? These guys over here, it took a heck of a lot of energy to shake the spring this fast. So um, these guys over here, the blue light, they have a whole lot of energy and the red and the yellow have lower energy. So, um, so when we're still talking about the yellow light, they're also going to have lower energy. Uh, which parts of your body should you avoid touching during a laboratory investigation? Well, goodness, this one right here, I, I sure hope there's an all of the above because, you know, picking your nose or scratching your butt or whatever it is that you're planning on doing during a lab investigation, those are bad ideas. Uh, but I'm guessing if they have a list, you would probably not want to touch your eyes. You would probably not want to touch your face. You would probably not want to touch your mouth. You would probably not want to touch, well, just about anything. So if there's not an all of the above, let's pick the eyes as being the worst. But if there is an all of the above, the parts of your body that you shouldn't touch are everything. Don't touch anything. Okay. <clears throat> Number 40. Looking at the placements of the elements in the diagram, what type of bond uh, would e exist between B and E? Now, on this, I really cannot see uh, the, the picture very well. Um, on this, so... I'm hoping that this is B and this is E. And if that's the case, both of those are non-metals, so that's going to be a covalent bond. Now, if I'm wrong and I'm not reading this correctly because it's very small on this printout, if they were on opposite sides, if we had a metal and a non-metal, then that would be ionic. But these two right here, that looks like uh, B and E to me. Uh, so two non-metals um, would be a covalent bond. All right, now we've got another one that's just as bad. Looking at the placement of the elements, what do you expect to form between G and E? So let's see if we can find G. All right, that right there looks like that might be G over there. Um, G would be in group number one. That would be a metal, and I'm assuming E is still over here. So if we have a metal plus a non-metal, that right there is going to be an ionic bond. And that all presumes that I can read this all right. The light's kind of dim, and that's really, really small. So hopefully that's good. Um, what is the group number, period, and group name of the element calcium? So calcium on our periodic table, that I do have right here. Here's calcium. So uh, when we're looking at stuff, well, it's in period 4. Right there, that says 4. And it's in group two, right there. So that's a lot of our answers. So it's in uh, group two. It's in period four. And then it says group name. So the group name right here, I hope all of you can read because it's on the periodic table at the front of the room. These are called the alkaline earth metals. And you should have that written down on at least one of the periodic tables that I've told you guys to hang on to. Remember that you can use all of those. Um, so hopefully you've got that written down. And if you can't find your periodic table, feel free to stand up Pretend like you need to come ask me a question, read what's on the board, and then walk back to your seat. I don't care. All right? Because it's up there for a reason. 
An unknown element was discovered that appeared to be a lustrous solid. Okay, it was also found to be a good conductor of heat and electricity. Based on this, these findings, this element is most likely a metal, a metalloid, or a non-metal. So, luster is one of the properties of metals. It's a good conductor, also a good indicator of metals. So I'm going to call this a metal. Uh, what part of the atom did Rutherford discover? He discovered the nucleus of the atom. Okay? Nucleus. If I can spell it. There we go. He discovered the nucleus of the atom. Later they discovered it contained protons, and another guy discovered neutrons, but the, the most important thing about Rutherford was the nucleus of the atom. Alright, the next question. Rank K, L, I, N, F, and N, A in order of increasing. That means from small to big atomic radius. Now we learned about atomic radius and we learned about, um, about trends. Now remember that the, the trend on the periodic table for atomic radius goes against our common sense. As we go across the periodic table, the elements actually get smaller. Okay, so we start bigger and then we get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the reason that they get smaller as we go across the periodic table like this is because we have more protons and electrons and remember they attract each other, right? So if I start over here and I've got 11 protons and 11 electrons and then I come way over here and I've got 15 or 16 protons and electrons well they're going to pull a lot stronger so as we go across the periodic table the elements get smaller and smaller and smaller. So when you look at a list like this and it says rank them from smallest to biggest, well, guess what? The smallest are over here and the biggest are over here. Okay, so the small ones are going to be on your right and that goes against your common sense. So let's take a look at our list. Um, we've got K. Uh, let me see if I can find a new color of pen. I'm running out of pens. I've got K uh, right here. I need a new pen. Uh, Angela, can you get me a marker? A big one? Highlighter? Anything really big. So this is good. So I've got K and I've got LI, which is way up here. And I've got NF and NA. So NA and over here I've got N and I've got F. So remember that as we go from the right side to the left side, we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's very clear that from here to here, we're getting bigger as we go across the periodic table uh, from this direction to this direction. So for our ranking, we must start with F being small and NA being next. Well, if we keep going and we're on the same row, eventually we're going to come over to LI, so that's going to be next. So for the start of our ranking, we're going to say F, well, let's go back to another pen. We're going to say F is going to be the smallest, and then we're going to say N is going to be next and then we're going to say LI 
is going to be next. So we saw how we went from F to N to LI. So what about these two here? Those weren't on our, you know, getting bigger because uh, uh, because they don't have as much charge. Well, these two are getting bigger for a whole different reason. Remember that NA it's got a nucleus and it's got one, two, three rings. Lithium has got a nucleus and it's got one, two rings. And K, it's got a nucleus and it's got one, two, three, four rings. So as we go down the periodic table, things also get bigger. So we started over here with smallest and then a little bigger and a little bigger. And then now as we go down the periodic table, we're getting way big as we go down. So our last two are going to be Na and K. What uh, group on the periodic table has the highest ionization energy? So we've already talked about ionization energy and electronegativity. And that guy is going to be this group over here. Um, these are our noble gases. Okay, they have the highest ionization energy. If they had asked which had the highest electronegativity, we'd have said the halogens. Halogens have the highest electronegativity, but the noble gases have the highest um, uh, ionization energy. Um, which of the following is a chemical or physical change? Milk souring. That's chemical. That's easy. Anytime we make something new, that's a chemical change. And if it smells bad, that's probably something new. Sugar dissolving. Dissolving is always physical. Okay? Because we can just evaporate the water and we got the sugar. Paper being shredded. That's physical as well. I mean, it's still paper. You may have to use a lot of tape to figure out what it said, but nothing has changed. We are almost done. Oh, apple rotting. Remember, apple rotting is the same as digesting or burning or rotting, so that's going to be chemical. What's the difference between a chemical property and a physical property? So the difference between the two is that a chemical property, in order to observe it, we have to make something, something, if I can write, new. So, a chemical property might be flammability, able to burn. How do I know if something's flammable? Well, I've got to burn it and see, and that makes something new. Uh, what about uh, being able to react with uh, some chemical? Well, I've got to react it with some chemical to see if it makes something new. Physical properties, I don't need to make anything new. Uh, is it blue? Yes, it's blue. I didn't have to make anything new. Is it breakable? Well, I might have to break it to find out, but is that does that make anything new? No, it's still broken pieces of whatever. So the big difference is a chemical property, in order to observe it or measure it, you have to actually make something new. State whether the following are physical changes or chemical changes. A newspaper oxidizing in the sun. There's your key word, oxidizing. Oxidizing means some kind of reaction. So that's going to be a chemical change. Okay? You know, when the newspaper turns old and yellow and stuff, that's a chemical change. Color changes are a good indication that a chemical change has occurred. Charcoal burning, also chemical Steel rusting, well that's something new, so that's chemical. Lettuce being shredded, no, that's physical, it's still lettuce. Okay. Alright, can the atomic number be different for atoms of the same element? 
The answer is no. Atomic number, that's the number of protons. That's what makes it the same element. Can the number of protons for uh, be different? No, that's the same as the atomic number. No. Can the number of neutrons be different for atoms of the same element? And that is a big whopping yes, because that is what we call an isotope. Okay? Remember, lithium, we have lithium-7, and we have lithium-6. Both of them have the same number of protons, three. That's what makes them lithium. But one of them has three protons, and one of them has four protons. So that's why one of them weighs six, and one of them weighs seven. Can the mass be different for atoms of the same element? And the answer to that is yes, for the same reason, isotopes. All right, we are all done with the review for the test.